You know, George Bush has said that anybody that has any connections to al Qaeda, I mean al Qaeda, should be arrested. Well, no one has greater connections to the Saudis and the House of Bin Laden than the Bushes. They've been in business together for decades. George Bush actually started his first oil company way back in 1976 with a member of the Bin Laden family and with their funds. My friends, the government had complete and total prior knowledge of the horrible events that happened here. And at the bare minimum, they allowed this tragedy to take place as a pretext to scare the population into total abject fear and then submission. In his film Fahrenheit 9-11, Michael Moore doesn't even talk about things that MSNBC and the Associated Press have reported on. That Osama bin Laden's code name in the CIA was Tim Osman. That he was a CIA asset trained in the 1970s and used against the Russians in the 1980s in Afghanistan. Then, of course, he helped against the Serbs in the late 1990s. Over and over again, Osama bin Laden has been used as a tool of the U.S. government and its interests. Anytime they need to create a crisis anywhere on the planet, bin Laden comes to their rescue as the fire starter they need to create the crisis so they can offer their solution. Or why didn't he talk about the huge 9-11 truth movement that sprung up right after 9-11, made up of hundreds of the victims' families of September 11th, alleging government involvement in the attacks? Why didn't the film talk about the official U.S. government plan to carry out terror attacks in America and blame it on foreign enemies? Operation Northwoods. It even called for hijacking jets by remote control and crashing them, bombing D.C., committing sniper attacks. No, Michael Moore didn't discuss this, something ABC News and the Baltimore Sun were willing to do Michael Moore wouldn't get near. In the three days after September 11, 2001, over 160 members of Osama bin Laden's family were flown out of the country to Saudi Arabia. This at a time when all commercial and private air traffic was grounded by the Pentagon. But that wasn't the only airlift. Seymour Hersh first broke the story at the New Yorker magazine about the airlift of evil. It was then picked up by major publications, but well forgotten into the memory hole. At the end of the three-week-long Afghan war in Afghanistan, 8,000 Taliban and Al-Qaeda leaders were loaded on U.S. government C-130s and flown out to Pakistan to safety. It had been their job to stir up the phony crisis in Afghanistan and then give George W. the fake victory. You see, it was a staged war. And this is one of the other big smoking guns of 9-11 government involvement that we're all supposed to forget about. Oh, the government admits they flew them out to safety, but Fox News said it was an accident. Yes, 8,000 Taliban and Al-Qaeda cream the leaders being flown out to safety. And top generals were told to release Taliban generals. They were told, let them go. And some of the generals got angry and went public. The FBI has gone public, as well as the CIA. It even leaked the orders, like W199I, where George Bush ordered them to back off Osama bin Laden and his family. In fact, they even fired some agents that refused to follow their orders. There were red flags everywhere. Everyone knew that the attack was coming. That's why so many public officials didn't go to New York. But months before, there was the Bush administration frustrating the investigations, ordering the agents off the cases, ensuring that the attacks would go forward. Then there were the media reports by respected institutions backed up by hospital officials at the American Hospital in Dubai of Osama bin Laden meeting with the CIA Middle East Section Chief for 10 days in July of 2001, months before September 11th. The question is, what was the CIA doing meeting with Osama bin Laden? Getting their story straight? Not just the campaign cash for George W. and Brother Jeb, there was a billion dollars the U.S. Treasury pumped into Brother Neil's bank, Silverado. And there's Brother Marvin. His investment funds are fattening on contracts for the war on terror. And Daddy, Bush Sr., became the first ex-president to sell his Oval Office connections for cash to oil companies and arms dealers. The Bushes are like other American dynasties. The Kennedys, the, the Rockefellers. But they've taken the game to a whole other level. See, the money gets them office, 
then the office gets them even more money. Call it the Bush cycle. And it's still rolling along. I went to speak to a man who'd witnessed the Bush family's uncanny ability to turn government service into cash. He'd occupied an inside seat in the spook world during the Reagan-Bush administration. Former national security agent Wayne Matson. It's the nature of the Bush families, particularly Bush Sr., to use um, contacts made from government service, head of the CIA, vice president, president of the United States, to basically call in favors later on. Bush Sr. and other former intelligence and political honchos have joined the private Carlyle Group, whose main work is selling arms to the U.S. government and a few dictatorships. Carlyle uses Sr. Bush to make entrees to various government offices around the world, to presidents and prime ministers and kings, sheikhs, emirs, sultans, what have you. But what Bush Sr. gets in return is he's part of these lucrative contracts, and he uses his connections to funnel the money into the Bush family coffers, which fun finds its way into the Bush campaign machine. Thank you. In 1988, George Bush Sr. won the presidency. At this time, a contract was awarded by the government of Bahrain to drill for oil in the Persian Gulf. Surprisingly, it went to a small-time Texas oil driller, Harkin Energy, who had little experience in the field. I asked investigative reporter Pete Bruton, then with the Houston Chronicle, how this happened. Harkin Oil in Texas gets an offshore contract to drill in the Persian Gulf. Yeah, it was a big mystery to everyone. All the analysts, everybody said, how did this happen? Nobody understood why it happened. Why didn't Amoco, why didn't Texaco, Mobil, Exxon, BP, why didn't they get the contract? They had the capital. Harkin didn't have any capital. And I found out it was because George W. Bush the president's son and our future president was on the board of directors. This document is marked secret and WF, which means it walked its way out of the Washington Bureau of the FBI. It indicates that before the attack of September 11th, agents had wanted to question two members of a very powerful family for their connections to a suspected terrorist organization, Omar and Abdullah bin Laden. But the agents weren't allowed to. Now, what makes this family so special that they're protected from investigation? To find out what lay behind the Bush administration's reluctance to look into the Bin Laden family, I went back to speak to our fighter pilot, Bill White. He went into business with a mysterious figure, James R. Bath, who managed the U.S. funds of a powerful Saudi family. I met many times with uh, Salman Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden's older brother, both in business settings and in social settings. We had parties there where a lot of the dignitaries and big business big wigs would party with the Arabs. So it was like la-la land. These guys drove around in limousines with suitcases full of cash. It was just amazing. <laughs> and those suitcases full of cash found their way from bin Laden to a man named James R. Bath. Bath actually presented me with a copy of a trust agreement, a one-page trust agreement that was signed in 1976 that appointed him as sole and exclusive representative for the Saudi bin Laden family in the United States of America and all their business ventures. And that bin Laden money allowed Bath to invest in another flyboy, our future president. Oh, that's right, George Bush Jr. and our Busto. That's correct. Do you know about that? Well, I know about it because Jim and I had to provide our personal financials to our lenders. And so I looked at his personal financial and there. You know, plain as day, it said, you know, our Busto, 79, $25,000, our Busto, 80, $25,000. So Bush's oil capital came from Bath, and Bath's money came, apparently, from the Bin Ladens. But why would they plow money into W's oil company? The money that Bath put into our Busto was nothing but an extension of this quid pro quo relationship between the Saudi royal family and the Bushes. The Saudi royal family was deathly afraid of the Ayatollah Khomeini and the radical Islamic movement. And so at that point in time, they went to the Bushes and said, look, protect us from the Ayatollah and these radical fundamentalists, and we'll give you whatever you want for your campaigns and to fund your, your kids' business interests. 
to fight your secret wars.